VA11 Valhalla is a visual novel released by Sukadon Games in 2016. The subtitle, Cyberpunk Bartender Action, aside from being a blatant Metal Gear reference, sufficiently sums up the premise. Billed as a so-called boozem-up, the reader takes the role of a bartender in a cyberpunk future. Sliding in from off-camera, I'm in one, the cyber boy from across the screen, and I'm going to spend the next 50 hours gushing about why Valhalla is my favorite visual novel. Spoiler City, as usual, you've played the visual novel, right? Okay. I'm going to be making some drinks because that's thematically relevant, so get yourself a drink. Let's go. First of all, the VN service level traits already stack things in its favor. A cyberpunk setting alone is enough to pique my interest. A story focusing on an unusual role for cyberpunk, that of a simple service worker, is nice. That role being filled by a cute girl is even nicer. Aesthetics inspired by an underutilized genre of retro games, a soundtrack that's equal parts lounge music, synthwave, and PlayStation game background music, a heavy focus on character interactions, and a premise which gives the player a blatant excuse to drink as they read. Any of these traits alone would improve a VN in my eyes, but all of them together is really something. Swab looking bartenders serving hackers, cyborgs, and robots. No need to overanalyze, this is already maximum cool. But I'm gonna overanalyze anyway. I'll start with going over the first day. After this little bit, which could maybe be seen as an opening cutscene, the VN begins its consistent flow. You start in the apartment of the protagonist, 27 year old bartender Jill Stingray. You can mess with her phone, which generally provides some flavor text that fleshes out the setting of Glitch City. Once you're ready, go to work. Chat with Gil, who gives you a tutorial on making drinks. The process of making these drinks is real straightforward. You're shown this mixing screen when the guest orders. Combine these very fictional ingredients in certain ratios to create certain cocktails. If you consider Valhalla to be a video game, this part is why. One of the main conceits is that the reader, or player, has some control over the story, the dialogue, etc. Um, I'll elaborate on my thoughts on that in a bit, but for now just keep in mind that if you get drinks wrong, Jill doesn't get paid. You need to get paid because Jill needs to pay rent at the end of the month. This comes into play immediately when the first guest shows up and orders a beer. The correct thing to do is give Donovan three big beers in a row. If you give him something even more alcoholic earlier on, his last drink order will be something non-alcoholic. Donovan's presence here is actually pretty neat. Might seem contrived for the owner of a popular news outlet Jill was just reading to show up as the first customer of the game, but I think it's worth it. It establishes early on a link between the world in general and what happens in the bar. Little touch to create a kind of continuity. Jill talks to Donovan between drinks, he leaves, next guest shows up. Jill serves more drinks, talks more. About halfway through the day's content, Jill goes on break, letting the player save their progress. Come back, more customers, more drinks, with more talking in between them. At the end of the day, you chat with Jill and Boss, see this daily results screen, and the next day begins, back in Jill's apartment. That's the loop, that's the VN. Like any visual novel, it's pretty much reading. But there's a surprising amount of character outside of the actual text, and it all comes down to the little details. Valhalla just feels cyberpunk. The beeps and boops of the UI are bolder, louder than usual. The more elaborate sound effects give me the idea of a strong presence of sci-fi technology. The sounds also have a dreamlike, ethereal quality, which makes their presence even more substantial, but also more pleasant. This philosophy on UI sound design is just a small part of the game's attempt to evoke a retro feel. The option for fake scan lines, the choices in color, the anime style pixel graphics all bring to mind visual novels for like the PC-98 or MSX. This alone might have an association with cyberpunk for many, it does for me. To quote Sukaban Games artist and co-founder Christopher Oritz, PC-98 games feel cyberpunk for example. Don't know why, just does. One fun detail is the menu for setting up the jukebox. When you want to preview a song, there's this sort of mock loading time. You know it's not real because you can just play these songs instantly on Jill's phone. But anyway, this reminds me of playing the MSX version of Snatcher and waiting a full 15 seconds any time just about anything happened. The graphical UI during shifts is the biggest thing to me, though. The bar and current guests are in this small window. 
the rest of the screen is taken up by the ever-present drink mixing menu and this thick border. In total, it's probably half the screen space. Using Snatcher as a comparison again should probably make it clear what they were going for. The ingredient menu being displayed when you're not using it is theoretically obscuring more stuff you could be looking at in the background, but compare it to a liquor well, which will almost always be in view of a real bartender, and it makes sense. You could say that maybe the mixing menu should be on the bottom of the screen, but rearranging the dialogue window over to the side might be a little too big a departure from what people are used to in a VN. That would be a worthy trade-off for more thematic cohesion in my opinion, but I can't complain. System Shock's UI comes to mind too, reinforcing the cyberpunk feeling even further. In that game, you're a cyborg hacker viewing the world through a neural interface. Given that the process of making drinks is clearly using sci-fi equipment of some kind, the UI, once again, gives me the feeling of a constant presence of technology. It's not just a person in some bottles anymore, it's a futuristic bartending station. Anytime a software has a retro-style aesthetic, you have to ask why, especially if it forgoes practicality to do it. Uh, the Cyberpunk Association is a good enough reason in my opinion, but this focused view window on the guest really seals the deal. In my mind, the way things are set up in Valhalla really puts a focus on the one-on-one -on -one interactions with guests, as well as the UI serving as a sort of extra touch of immersion. Kind of like serving a guest at a real bar. You've got your liquor well, ice well, POS, soda gun, all there, just a little bit out of view. All this in mind, Valhalla could have hardly been any other way. This narrow visual focus on the guests feels right to me since the main meat of the game is its characters. Talking to a bunch of cyborgs and robots in a casual setting is probably the hook for most people. It's through these characters that the cyberpunk world of Valhalla is explored. Heavy exposition is often frowned upon, but I think visual novels tend to get a little bit of slack for that. Whatever the reason for that may be, I think Valhalla is especially suited for it. When you're at a bar, it's the perfect environment to just ask people about their background or their career or whatever. It occurred to me on day 17, as Stella and Jill were talking at length about white knight armor being a hot commodity, the entire encounter was basically a big lore dump. We learned several details about the White Knight armor technology, uh, about how Zaibatsu Corp came to power, a variety of things which don't really flesh out Stella, Jill, or even say at all. In just about any other context, I'd say we're being told, not shown, what Glitch City is like. But I'm sure you get where I'm going. Seems like being shown and not told because it's just Jill having a chat with Stella. This is what the premise of Valhalla is all about, learning about this future dystopia by having conversations with interesting characters. It's all a matter of how natural the dialogue seems and the context surrounding the topic. Stella is a rich corporate elite who's best friends with a white knight, so of course Jill would ask her about these things. It's not one of those weird things that happens a lot in sci-fi or fantasy, where some character will ask some question about the world, that they live in, that they should already know, for the audience's sake. Still, Valhalla doesn't rely on these lore dump type moments. Most scenes with a character are meant to flesh out that character. They are the focus after all. Uh, and honestly, all of the characters in Valhalla are cyberpunk as hell. At the same time, most of them are some sort of subversion of a cyberpunk trope, and if they're not... At the very least, they have something interesting going on beyond what's on the surface. I'll go in depth and explain how. I'm going to go in kind of a list since the main narrative of Valhalla almost takes a back seat to these guest interactions. Alma is an underground criminal hacker who is not just a woman, but a total Stacy with giant tits. Enough of a tech geek to get her hands chopped off to be replaced with cybernetic enhancements, Alma is clearly passionate about her job. A hacker, the likes of which you'd expect to be a pale, skinny, nerdy-looking dude, or maybe a scruffy, shady guy in a trench coat. Alma's out here in a ribbed sweater looking fine, going out to a bar, talk to her friend, dating guys, worrying about her family. Her family issues are one of my favorite things in the game. Everyone can relate, we've all got a story of some less savory member of our family, bringing down those around them. Even if you're the type to not get involved in such family drama, you at least know about it. The great thing about Alma is that those things are what are front and center in the story. 
The Alice Rabbit stuff is in the background. Jill reads about it in the augmented eye occasionally, the news reports on it on TV. But criminals have regular lives too, especially those who are anonymous. They have family and friends and personal stuff that still matters to them. Playing as Alma's close friend, that's the side of her we get to see. Say and Stella essentially represent the establishment of a typical cyberpunk story. Say is a member of a police force that's shown to be brutally abusive. Stella, a member of the ultra-rich class in a setting where wealth inequality is higher than any first worlder can imagine. And they're portrayed as good people. Rather than one-dimensional villains to be beaten by some hero, Say and Stella both have moments in which they discuss their personal beliefs, their motivations, what made them the way they are. These moments are pretty well written. I can see lots of Western visual novels straying into just being rants of what the writer believes in moments like these, but Stella grilling art just seems like what she as a person genuinely thinks. Dorothy is a robot prostitute with the body of a child. She's completely mentally mature, equivalent to a woman in her 20s, but she still looks like a kid, meaning her clients must be... Well, I'm gonna talk about something else. Because there's an aspect of Dorothy that's less controversial, yet in my opinion more interesting. That's Dorothy's upbeat attitude. Despite the unsavory moral dilemma Dorothy's appearance brings up, she's a very popular character. Valhalla hasn't come under a lot of controversy for her inclusion, Rather, just about everyone loves her, and that's probably because of her personality. She lights up the bar whenever she walks in, her high energy and positivity make her impossible to hate. That applies to her sex work too. Rather than come across as downtrodden and desperate like every other escort in fiction, Dorothy revels in her profession. She loves taunting Joe with stories of her degeneracy. The very first scene with her, she's messing with a nano camo device shows she has a kind of passion. She's willing to put effort and research into providing for clients with unusual fetishes or paraphilias. For a character that could easily fall into a stereotypical role, she's surprisingly layered. Streaming Chan might be tied with Donovan for showing how we live in a cyberpunk dystopia in real life. Some combination of cam girl and boisterous YouTuber, Streaming Chan is willing to do just about anything for more views. At least that's how she seems on the surface. What I like about Nicole is the balanced approach the VN takes. Her story highlights the self-destructiveness often seen from real-life content creators. Non-stop hustle, people feeling genuinely guilty for taking a day off from streaming, putting off sleep to get the latest video out on time. I don't do either of those things. The erotic aspects of Nicole have a bit of a dark tinge too. She doesn't just take her clothes off for her subscribers, rather she just lets them see her entire life, including her sex life including her showers, and although I'd rather not think about it, probably her toilet breaks. This brings up one of the most cyberpunk aspects of real life 2020. Privacy is becoming harder and harder to come by. Much of it is due to strong arming from governments and corporations, but a lot of it is due to sheer indifference from the masses. Seeing how many people earnestly buy things like Alessa is a big black pill for me. In the case of Streaming Chan, it's a sacrifice she's willing to make for more attention. But like I said, there's a balance. Streaming Chen seems mostly happy about her lifestyle. She's a performer of sorts, and there can be something exciting and liberating about the thought of making your deepest secrets public. Many YouTubers and streamers put out false images of themselves, stuck in a weird spot of having to seem genuine, but maintain an image. Streaming Chen bypasses all that and basically forces herself to show the world who she really is at all times. In that way, she might have a deeper connection with her fans than almost any real-life content creator. I've made some original observations here, but a lot of the stuff I've said about the characters so far isn't really insightful on my part. Sukaban themselves describe much of what I've said on their blog, along with their intention to break character stereotypes in general. So now I'm going to look at some characters they haven't talked about. Jamie is a buff, rough-looking, cyber-augmented assassin who's very polite, soft-spoken, has a sense of morals he applies to his job. He gets a little flustered when Dorothy starts talking about her work and is clearly being a little melodramatic when talking about war. Taylor is a typical cyberpunk concept taken to an extreme. The relationship between identity and body has been explored a lot. This is the underlying theme of the Ghost in the Shell franchise reflected even in its name. Naturally, Valhalla explores this in a more mundane way. How could a brain in a jar enjoy a stiff drink? 
Would someone who's now just a brain still be attracted to hot babes like Alma? How relevant would their gender still be? How would they regard their past life with their old body? I thought it was a very cool decision to make Taylor someone who previously had a debilitating medical condition, and that they consider their current body much more liberating. This, in combination with Taylor's upbeat attitude and eagerness to explain the details of their situation, is what really makes them interesting. It seems analogous to someone with some kind of physical handicap being given a lot more mobility by prosthetics and loving life because of it. Also, I think it's funny that there's a conversation with Dorothy about solipsism when an actual brain in a jar isn't around. Finally, my man, the based and red pill Donovan. Owner of the augmented eye, lover of beer and robot women, the man who makes the impossible possible. Donovan's big, boisterous, masculine personality makes him an easy choice for funniest character in the story. His situation and insights are an interesting topic, though. The augmented eye is akin to real-life blogging and news outlets like Docker, BuzzFeed, Vice, pretty much anything on the internet at this point. Donovan details how his top priority at the augmented eye is clicks. He doesn't care what the topics of articles are or whether they're filled with lies. Get clicks, make money, Simple as. Donovan gives the ultimate red pill when he offers Jill a job as a ghostwriter, saying that most of his staff are just that. The message here isn't just the obvious clickbaity trash news sites are bad. Rather, the point is that the people behind them know they're bad. That might be obvious to you and me, but all the time I see people seething over articles. Articles which either aren't meant to be taken that seriously, or were written solely to get attention with no regard to anything else. Pay attention to Jill's comments that she normally doesn't see the worst of AE's articles due to her filter settings. We don't have much excuse to feel angry, or feel much of anything at all, when we see a stupid article on the internet. Not if we also acknowledge that so many of them are just trying to get clicks. We bear some self-responsibility to control what we see and choose to engage with. While there isn't much to make Donovan himself very deep, he's an enjoyable character. You're kind of supposed to hate him, but he makes plenty of good points. He brings both cynicism and levity. The way the internet has made news more about SEO, provocative titles, thumbnails, and rabble-rousing is one way we're actually living in a cyberpunk nightmare. Exploring this topic with someone like Donovan could easily just make him bumbling or overly evil. Going with someone a little more grounded is much more effective in a story like this. Oh, well, that took forever, but you get the idea, yeah? The characters in Valhalla pretty much across the board have something going on under the surface. But even as far as that surface level interaction goes, Valhalla's enjoyable just because the dialogue sounds so natural. I mean, you kind of want that when you're talking about a one-on-one -on -one interaction with guests in a casual environment, a relaxing bar. That kind of dialogue, in my experience, is... Pretty unusual. I mean, whether you're talking about movies, books, obviously video games, for better or worse. And especially, anime. Valhalla is very inspired by otaku culture, but that isn't reflected much in the writing. Gotta be honest, other than a few very specific things, I'm not a fan of otaku culture, so I love that Kiririn51 has an anime-inspired art style, but Lark doesn't seem to have been inspired in his writing by typical visual novels. The realism of Valhalla's characters stems from the writing's basis in reality. Uh, on the Sukaban Games blog, they actually talk about how Stella in particular is based on someone they know in real life. Whether or not it's literally the case, I can see that being the case for a lot of the game's characters. A Moe-type character from a Nitro Plus visual novel seems more like an alien than a human. I have to admit, I do have a soft spot for childish Spur characters like Mayushi here, but I have to suspend a lot of disbelief for her. Cyberpunk stories in particular wouldn't work too well with these otaku characters, since one of the main points of cyberpunk is being a more cynical, seemingly realistic take on sci-fi. It's about answering the question of how would real people truly behave in this future society. Having characters that seem like regular, flawed humans in such a setting is a lot more effective than an inhuman blob of cuteness. It's probably why some of the most successful cyberpunk stories in anime and manga are less otakuish and more grounded. Lane, Gitz, Akira, Psychopaths. You could meet characters from these stories in real life, and the only thing that would stand out is maybe their appearance. 
Still, there's an infusion of otaku culture in Valhalla, but that's actually what's really great about it, because this influence is in-universe. Multiple formative cyberpunk works depicted a blending of Western and Japanese culture. Japan was considered to be kind of a global economic powerhouse at the time, so it made sense for stories which looked to the future to consider how that cultural influence might progress. Easy. Are you going to keep easy in there? Mm-hmm. Okay. Neuromancer features a main character who is basically a weeaboo living in Chiba. Blade Runner is the example everyone is thinking about, though, with its Los Angeles apparently seeing a ton of Japanese immigration and the surrounding culture changing to match. So, yeah. Early cyberpunk works often considered how Western and Japanese culture might mesh. Now that we're actually in the cyberpunk future of 2020, I can confidently say it actually happened, though maybe not exactly how they thought it would. The interesting thing about Valhalla is that as a modern cyberpunk work, it actually has a bit of an advantage in this regard since it can just depict this merger by basing it on real life. Like, half the game's cultural references are just weeaboo-inspired stuff. Jill and Dana talking about Kotatsu, and, you know, knowing what that is. Nano Kamotan. 90% of the women have become lesbians. Toku is on TV. Kira Miki shows the normalization of idol culture. Hey, did you know Miku is at Coachella this year? Told you, it's happening. Update, Corona, I guess it's not happening, but you get the point. Most prominently, the fashion. It isn't just the art style that makes everyone look like an anime character after all. Jill probably has the most mundane appearance of anyone, and even she's sporting a pair of anime-style twin tails. The interesting thing about this is that the Japanese influence is multi-layered. Glitch City probably is meant to be a western area with a Japanese presence, but these decisions were ultimately made because the game devs are otaku. The third layer being the game's cyberpunk setting in and of itself. Even without any context about Japanese culture, odd colored hair or unconventional fashion is more believable in a sci-fi world. Stella's appearance is a good example of these three principles at work. Her status as a cat girl is from the developer's knowledge of weird anime stereotypes, but in universe, it's the effect of a cutting edge medical procedure. That and her eye are as cyberpunk as it gets. As for her hairdo, it's easy to imagine the idea of twin drills being less weird after decades of westerners being exposed to anime. There have been more elaborate fashion trends throughout history, and Stella being a very rich elite with kind of gaudy taste adds the last needed bit of believability. While Valhalla has garnered a ton of praise, with most seeming content to not even nitpick, the little bit of criticism I have heard is regarding these mechanics, the drink mixing. As much as I love Valhalla, I have to say I agree. For one thing, the mixing is just too simple. It's pretty much never an issue to figure out what kind of drink to make a customer. The guests almost always tell you exactly what cocktail they want. On the rare occasion that they don't, the hints the game gives are patronizing. For you. It doesn't help that the list of ingredients is very small. No garnishes, no selecting different glassware, no different kinds of ice, nothing like that. Thing is, this is holding the game to my own arbitrary standards. I like games more than visual novels. Describing the issue this way is treating Valhalla like it should be a puzzle game. That's clearly not what it's going for, and I think a more appropriate comparison is to, you know, other visual novels. The fact that Valhalla has any game mechanics at all puts it ahead of the pack compared to more traditional VNs. The kind that are basically choose-your-own-adventure novels, except some barely even having enough choice to qualify as that. There are other VNs which feature more in-depth gameplay, but I gotta point out that usually these VNs segregate their gameplay and VN content. Often they won't interact at all, even when there are obvious opportunities for it. In Girls Frontline, minor spoilers, there are parts in the story in which certain units go missing. But they're still perfectly capable of being in your teams. The gameplay is completely unaffected by what's going on in the story. Considering the game's surface level appeal of collecting all these girls, it could have some real impact if you were temporarily restricted from using them until you rescued them. 
Almost every other VN with substantial game mechanics, the ones I've played at least, are like this. Their mechanics don't interact at all with the story. They're both there, but separate. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but in many cases, VNs stand to benefit from weaving any game mechanics they had into their narratives. Valhalla is one of the few visual novels that breaks that mold. So, let me go back to my original complaint. Drink mixing is too simple. How does that change when looking at Valhalla as a visual novel that uses game mechanics to seamlessly support it? Here's where I mention that I'm actually a bartender in real life. Not a very experienced one, but nonetheless. In my experience, guests don't play games with you about what they want to drink. They'll tell you what they want, you make it, that's it. There are times when a guest won't know exactly what they want, they'll ask me for suggestions. There's room for creativity on my part here, but it's never difficult for me to find something that works for them. When Kudamiki asks for something that's like tea, it's a little frustrating to the gamer in me that the solution is to just select the tea, but that's perfectly analogous to how it is in real life. The hardest thing about it is that Kiramiki isn't real. That's figuring out what drinks you should make, how about how shallow and even mindless it is to build a drink once you've picked one. Well, I can say with complete confidence that the average drink I serve in real life is easier to make than the average cocktail in Valhalla. Johnny Walker Black Ice, Apple Crown Ice, Bullet Neat, Maker's Ice, Henny Ice, Tito's and Cran, Ciroc and Cran, Macallan 12 Neat, Vodka Soda, Water, 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 Please, Water, No Ice, Can I just get a glass of ice, please? Not to mention, some people just want a draft beer. Cheap or expensive, complex or simple, it's all easy. But please don't tip the same, okay? If you find it a little mundane in Valhalla to be asked what kind of drink to make exactly, look it up by name and just do it with no real thought put into it, well, sometimes that's how I feel after serving seven beers and ten waters in a row. Uh, you know, I'm glad people are staying hydrated. I actually think it would be worth it to have these drink mixing sections even if it were impossible to get the drink wrong. Like if you got the wrong drink, the game just wouldn't let you progress until you got it right. It would be worse, but these breaks in the dialogue that force the player to physically build it themselves does a lot for immersion compared to non-stop reading. Inconvenience is a funny way of doing that. The simple act of having to go all the way back to HQ to look something up on the computer and Snatcher had a similar effect. So does the clunky, sometimes annoying movement system in the silver case, as weird a comparison as that might sound. Those things aren't challenging or engaging at all, but they make the situations feel more legit. The story takes place in a small, back alley bar described as a shoddy looking place, one with only a few customers at a time. The VN's focus is chatting one-on-one -on -one with guests, taking your time to get to know them. This message that shows the moment you start a new file tells you everything you need to know about the feeling the VN is trying to convey. Relax, unwind, enjoy the story. Take in the atmosphere of the bar, the cyberpunk aesthetics. Have some sippies. My recent very stressful first playthrough of Papers, Please made it clear just how much Valhalla benefited from keeping it simple. But to really show how simple drink mixing was a good idea, let me say this. For as much as I've gone on about how easy things are, I got the bad ending my first playthrough. Jill has to sleep with Alma now? Oh no! That's so terrible. I would hate having to sleep with Alma. I missed some drinks, didn't serve the most expensive drinks that I could have when I got them right, and even missed some more obvious major story stuff. Am I dumb? Yes, but the main reason this happened is that during like half my playthrough, I had a buzz going. The other half, I was outright drunk. Had to do it. It's Valhalla. It's the perfect visual novel to drink along with. So, the visual novel is trying to create a relaxed, sometimes intentionally mundane experience that focuses on its narrative. That in mind, there are some things that could have been done better. And this is where my real complaints, the ones that aren't just super subjective nitpicks, come in. Drink descriptions and lore is put to use sometimes, but is sometimes completely meaningless. For example, a fringe weaver doesn't count as a sweet drink despite its description saying it tastes like a spoonful of sugar. Rewarding the players more for paying attention to details outside of these rigid sections would be nice. If mundanity is one of the goals, the game could have gained from more ingredients and options. 
It wouldn't have increased the actual depth of gameplay, but that's actually kind of my point. More steps to take that were just monotonous could improve immersion. I mentioned garnishes and stuff, but it could also be something like entering orders and managing tabs in a POS system, cleaning glassware, keeping track of returning customers, maybe for some kind of rewards program. None of it would be that engaging, but just having to do them would have an impact. The whole rewards program idea, of course, has a lot of room to synergize with customer interaction. For example, Ingram here visits the bar multiple times, and every time he does, he acts like an asshole and then says he's not coming back when he leaves. But he comes back. Wouldn't something like a customer file with an integrated rewards program make that more fun? It's also disappointing that there's no penalty for poor performance before serving drinks. A time limit would encourage players to actually memorize recipes rather than look them up every time. It could be a generous limit, nothing stress-inducing, but of course, if a bartender takes 15 minutes to make you an old-fashioned in real life, you probably won't tip them. Combine that with some kind of penalty for trashing a drink you got wrong and you'd actually have a pretty fun system. Maybe different orders could have different time limits to reflect a guest's personality or their mood in the moment. For example, at some point there would be one so short that no player would reasonably make it, showing that they came into the bar already pissed off or stressed out. But the real twist of the knife is how wrong drinks have low narrative punishment, or whatever you would call it. Yeah, I know, you need to make money to pay rent, but that's not so much a punishment as it is just a certain ending. No, I don't want to sleep with Alma, help me! No, I mean the immediate response and dialogue. I went through a lot of the game serving people nothing but big fringe weavers, except for when they actually ordered fringe weavers, and a good chunk of the time their reaction was fairly passive. Stella giving me ellipses three times in a row and then just going on with her usual dialogue came off as though Lark had run out of ideas. It's important to note that these points aren't really about a flaw in Valhalla, they're about untapped potential. Solutions to my complaints don't involve taking anything out of the game or reworking things, but adding stuff. More content is kinda iffy to ask from a $15 visual novel made by a contracted music composer and two Venezuelans from 4chan. Sukaben Games' earlier visual novels, released not too long before Valhalla, give the impression of two dudes just figuring out how to use Rinpi. Blazing Food is basically just a few jokes. Devil's Journal ended up only ever being a five-minute demo filled with broken English. After playing those, I'm actually impressed by the number of situational responses to wrong drink orders. It's easy to get lost brainstorming cool stuff to add to any game. After all, you can always ask for one more thing. After my first playthrough, I did a lot of testing to see just how much you can affect in Valhalla. It's a lot. Big scenes can happen with some of the major characters. There are lots of opportunities to get guests drunk, and sometimes it seems like kind of a puzzle to figure out how to do it while still not missing drink orders. As is the game's reputation, sometimes getting guests drunk will get them to reveal some deep stuff about themselves. Sometimes keeping them sober is the way to get them to open up. Either way, the way the player and Jill can interact with the world around them makes perfect sense. I mean, as a bartender, Jill is not the hero of Valhalla's story. If anything, she's more like an NPC. There's no reason she should have some huge impact on her overall environment or the overarching narrative. I didn't talk about Jill during my big description of characters earlier, but she is the player character, the one serving all the drinks you serve, and she's one of the main reasons I love this visual novel so much. Jill seems well suited for a player character filling an NPC type role. She isn't exactly a blank slate, but she has a low-key agreeable personality. She's slightly cynical, but only as much as you might expect a bartender to be. She's professional, polite, in control of her emotions. When talking to others, she tends to ask them questions and let them take the lead. But even this doesn't necessarily confer a personality trait since, again, that's what you'd expect from a bartender. When asked for her own opinions and beliefs, it's usually something pretty normal. In her private life, she never seems to go anywhere except J.C. Elton's. Wouldn't want to ruin the flow of the game, after all. She's even bisexual. In a visual novel that was originally billed as all about cyberpunk waifus, this opens up a lot more opportunities for shipping. She's young and attractive herself, so we can fawn over her too. Jill has just enough personality to not seem weird, but clearly reined in so that we can project ourselves onto her. 
perfect player character NPC hybrid. At least that's what the game wants us to think. The hints regarding Jill's situation are in plain sight from the beginning, starting with the letter that most players will probably forget about. Glimpses of Jill's vulnerability can be seen here and there, maybe most prevalent in needing to regularly buy useless crap to keep her from getting distracted at work. It may not seem significant at first. After realizing that Jill has a habit of running away from her problems though, it seems less like an attempt at a game mechanic and more like we're being shown that Jill can be irresponsible. When the Gabby bomb goes off on day 9, we learn that Jill's ex-girlfriend died recently. Her ex-girlfriend that she's had no contact with for three years, who she last saw during their breakup that was so hateful that it doesn't even seem to have been an official breakup. It's sad Jill lost her chance to make amends, knowing that she had so long to do it and still couldn't makes it much worse. It's an emotional moment for sure, and that may be why the game started to lose me at this point, for just a bit. I felt bad for Jill's loss. I understood her angrily defending herself against Gabby and then becoming an emotional mess after. I got her being distracted and mopey the next day, but for a short bit I kinda didn't like it. I didn't like the sudden focus on my really hot self-insert being distraught over the death of some character neither I or any of the other characters knew anything about. The very little players heard about Lenore up to this point made her sound like someone I would probably hate. That didn't help. But the feeling didn't last long as I realized what the story was doing. Soon after, when Alma and Jill swapped places at the bar, even my drunk ass got the message. Jill is her own character. She has her own past that even we don't know about. Being chill and kind of passive in conversations isn't for our convenience, it's just how she is. She also has a juvenile sense of humor, drinks cheap beer, is irresponsible with money, likes video games, likes porn, is patient with others, is smart enough that she was once involved in elite-level academia, and often procrastinates rather than facing her problems. That's Jill. This change in the story's focus is interesting for a few reasons. For one thing, it's more like an extra layer on top of the previous barrage of customer interactions. Those are still present because Jill can't just miss a bunch of work because she's sad. Another thing is that the Gabby encounter takes place almost exactly halfway through the story. Coming to think of Jill as her own person puts a lot of what you've read from her in the first half in a slightly new light. It also leaves plenty of room for new dialogue from her to explore her nuances with this in mind from the start. A fun aspect of all this is a character I never hear anyone talk about. Gillian was originally meant to be a playable counterpart to Jill. Are you a boy or a girl? That kind of thing. Whether Sukaban Games originally decided against it because they wanted to focus on fleshing out the player character more, I'm not sure, but that's what ended up happening. What's left over is a character who, intentionally or not, highlights Jill's unique role as a non-hero, not actually a stand-in character. If anyone has potential to be the hero of Valhalla's story, it's either Say or Gil. The game never details what exactly is going on with Gil, that's the point, he's a mystery, but he's clearly been through some serious action hero stuff in the past, and we see it still haunting him throughout the VN. Given that Dana mentions him continuing to use fake IDs to find a job after the bar closes, that isn't likely to change. Gil is basically a more stereotypical cyberpunk hero version of Jill. While he has all that stuff going on, they're pretty similar. They have very similar personalities. They're both around the same age and attractive in a similar kind of way. No homo. This scene where Jill gets on Gil's case about not opening up to people is a nice bit of irony. If their names didn't drive the point home, this conversation will. Jill is my kind of girl. I think I really understand her character, and it's made reading her dialogue a lot more fun. She's not a hero in the usual sense, and that's great. She's great because she's perfectly suited for the role her character plays, not that of a player stand-in, but that of a bartender in a cyberpunk dystopia future. Jill couldn't rescue Say from a hostage situation at the bank, but she could comfort Stella when Say was missing and listen to Say vent once she showed up. Jill couldn't reason Dorothy out of her existential crisis, but she could remember her favorite drink, reminding her that her feelings for the people she cares for are real. Jill couldn't make amends with Lenore, but she could reconnect with Gabby and serve her her first alcoholic drink. 
Very important milestone for anyone. Jill couldn't fix Alma's family problems, bring Ingram's daughter back, let Kiramiki live a normal life, or keep the bar from closing down. But while it was open, she could serve the right drink at the right time to lift people's spirits. <laughs> spirits. Jill's mantra of mixed drinks change lives is truer than she realizes. Sukaban games changed my life. Might sound stupid to say I got into craft cocktails because of a visual novel that's barely about the cocktails, but that's what happened. Make fun of me. Valhalla's drink mixing mechanics may lack depth, detail, or accuracy, but the relative simplicity of making drinks, along with talking to guests all the time, conveys the feeling of bartending. The writing meshes almost seamlessly with those mechanics. There's clever little details within that writing almost every minute. This review would be twice the length if I pointed them all out. Most importantly to me, the way Jill is handled is really great. I love Valhalla. It's got fun dialogue, deep characters, explores interesting sci-fi concepts, has cute girls, a top-tier soundtrack, is extremely stylish, and is maximum comfy. All of this is why it's stuck with me for years now. Best visual novel. Out of ten. If you don't like it, I'm going to kill you. Look. Pause the video. Go make yourself a drink. And then come back with it. Okay? You back? You got your drink? Alright. Thank you. Very much for cooperating. A toast to the best visual novel in existence. Dink. Easy.